Um, okay, so I begin with two um, epigraphs. The first is by uh, Stacy Doris from her book, Not. She writes, form means we keep changing our minds at every velocity due to life. Poetry is that fact's lucidity. Uh, the second epigraph is from Kant's Critique of Judgment. The art of poetry, he says, which owes its origin almost entirely to genius and will be guided least by precept or example, claims the highest rank of all. It expands the mind by setting the imagination free and presenting within the limits of given concepts and among the unbounded manifold of forms, possibly agreeing with it, the one that connects its presentation with a fullness of thought to which no linguistic expression is fully adequate. Okay, so done with, with the um, epigrams. By way of a prologue, I will borrow from the work of Judith Balso, who opens her book, Affirmation of Poetry, by placing it under the sign of Heinrich von Kleist. This sign is one that designates a principle that sets the relation between the event of poetry and the condition of constraint. In 1810, under Napoleon's occupation of Prussia, Kleist set out to publish a newspaper called the Berliner Abendblätter. Met with heavy censorship, the journalism of the period was, as Kleist himself described in an earlier published pamphlet, the art of making people believe what the government believes it appropriate for them to believe. Kleist's project with this new newspaper was to subvert the constraint of the state by exposing the mechanisms for the imposition of belief. Balso writes, Kleist knew how to use the policing constraint that was imposed upon him by censure against itself in order to make the most subtle and percussive use of it and in, to underscore the censure and circumvent it. So the circumvention of the policing constraint often took the form of publishing the police themselves in their own words. The paper would republish police reports and sometimes even direct mandates and correspondences between the paper and the police. Consider, for example, the following excerpt from a special edition of the paper. An order from the Royal Prefect of Police, M. Gruner, who supports any enterprise of public interest with as much kindness as goodwill, leads us to the obligation of inserting into this special edition any article concerning, quote, the extraordinary events or representing an interest from the point of view of the police. That's the end of the excerpt. This insertion discloses the policing constraint on two levels. We have first the explicit and official police stance on the role of the newspaper as a tool of the state and an extension of police surveillance. Clay's publication of this request exposes the formal constraint designated by the state regarding the both the formal and informal purpose of the paper, its unofficially official status as a tool of police surveillance. The prefect's letter goes on to implicate the project of the newspaper with, quote, the constitution of not only a permanent chronicle of the city of Berlin, but of the entire kingdom of Prussia, end quote. The public exposure of a private letter regarding the aim and role of the newspaper thus makes unofficial police interference official. Further, it exposes the extent of police power without any editorial judgment. Letting the voice of power speak for itself in this instance merely enables its own undoing. A kind of childlike repetition of the father's command reflects the father to himself, embarrassing him at the exposure of his own absurdity. The second disclosure of this inclusion is one of tone. Kleist republishes not only the content of the police's command, but also the salutation that goes along with it, the prefect's language of kindness and goodwill towards the enterprise of the newspaper. These words mask a stern edict under the guise of approbation, and its public repetition renders the pleasantry doubly farcical. That is, its first iteration from the police prefect to the newspaper editor extends an almost banal gesture of friendliness, but when repeated in the paper, exposes a more sinister possibility of a kind of partnership between the institutions of the police and that of the newspaper. The second iteration of kindness and goodwill in the newspaper's republishing of the police order reveals to the public the path to collusion of importantly, or at least nominally, separate bodies. It shows how the pernicious partnerships of power are forged and exposes the hypocrisy of a nominally free press. Freedom here is reduced to the exposure of its own impossibility. The freedom of Kleist's journalism lies in his obsession with the project of de delimitation of form, 
by presenting newspaper stories with explicit reference to the conditions in which they're produced, by delimiting the relationships between the newspaper and the state, Kleist sets and resets the project of journalism as a literary genre. His work as an editor was driven by a reflection on journalism's claim to truth and the frames of objectivity in reporting. The explicit purpose of journalism, Kleist wrote, is to represent the simple and direct manner of informing the people of what is happening in the world. It is an entirely private activity, and the objectives of the government, whatever their designation may be, are foreign to this practice. There is an implicit distinction here between the act of informing and that of representing the manner of informing. The documents that Kleist continually used to report events were primarily official police documents, presenting an absence of editorializing. By doing this, his reporting put the reader in an active position, setting the reader outside of the domain of the relations of production and consumption. In short, Kleist's reporting enabled judgment, a concept that I will uh, return to later. What made Kleist's reporting unique was its tarrying at the borders of its own possibility, its refusal to merely obey its constraints, to insist instead on naming them. This form of writing and reporting was a radical exposure of the limits, using not only the mandates and relations within the police um, um, mandates, um, but also the form of journalism as one of reporting. Kleist magnificently takes advantage of the initial constraint in excessively informing his readers in using and exaggerating each detail, as well as theatrically staging the functioning of rumors. This kind of reporting is the introduction to what Balso calls the poetic event. Saying what journalists cannot say by exposing the limits of what they can say, Kleist brought poetry to journalism. She writes, the pure poetic work, using merely the police materials, is capable of producing the possibility of dual effects, and thus of dual understandings. Police literature, the literature of reports, is imperceptibly turned into fiction, just enough to allow for the power of the real to emerge. The singular greatness of poetic work is that it conceives itself as fiction, which thinks itself as a fiction, and it does this without having its sights set towards the skeptical or nihilistic ends, but according to a principle of affirmation and truth. Kleist's form of journalism was perhaps able to delimit and define journalism only by reaching outside of it. His attempt to communicate what journalism ought to communicate on his own account, that is to represent simply and directly, as he put it, the manner in which we learn what is happening in the world, was a project that required him to set an example for the practice of exposing the limits of poetry, or of journalism, by borrowing from gestures of poetry. So the story of Clay's newspaper um, offers, I think, an example of what it is to set an example, a phenomenon I want to draft here in this presentation as we think about the various meanings of poiesis. Exemplarity entails a relation to the constraint of a form, a kind of play at the borders of a practice. In Kleist's case, the constraint of form was set first by the genre of journalism, with its pretense to objectivity, and second by its operation within a police state. On both fronts, his reporting played with the limits of the form and thus reset them. This is the trick of the exemplar. On the one hand, she works within the constraints of a practice, placing her work squarely within the domain of a recognizable form. And on the other, her work pushes past the form, setting and resetting the dimensions and measurements of the practice itself. More than random deviations or minor alterations, exemplarity is not just a happy accident. Rather, it seems to access the necessary excess of its own practice and to re reconfigure the practice on the basis of this excess. As such, it is a practice of making and remaking practices, of inducing the subtle and poetic mutation of forms. So in what follows, I will glean from the work of both Immanuel Kant and Julia Kristeva in order to assemble some beginner speculations on this phenomenon of poetic ex exemplarity. Without reducing the thinking of Kant and Kristeva to an identity, I want to suggest that they each speak to the mysterious mode of exemplarity in their respective accounts of genius as a relationship to excess. Genius for Kant is nature giving the rule to art. It is the schematization of the, symbol, of the supersensible. Genius for Kristeva is a figure who goes beyond herself. It is a particular relation between the masculine and the feminine, between the semiotic and the symbolic. So I'll unpack all of this. I'm just giving us 
some of the big picture. Through the enigmatic exemplar in the figure of the genius, both Kant and Kristeva articulate the possibility of the new, a possibility that is bound up with the project of poetry in their respective accounts. So let me take up each in order. So first, Kant. Neither entirely underivative, nor wholly imitative, the work of genius offers what Kant calls an exemplary originality. It is exemplary insofar as it is an emulation of a prior form of genius. It takes up that which precedes it and offers a full and robust example of the kind of thing that it is. And yet, originality must be its primary characteristic. The work of genius is never merely an imitation of its predecessors. The delicate tension between exemplarity on the one hand and originality on the other offers a funny kind of equation that makes up Kant's accounting for the possibility of genius. Like the logic of the sovereign, that of the genius can be understood in terms of an included exclusion, a kind of rule setting that is itself outside of the rule. Kant writes, genius is entirely opposed to the spirit of imitation, though imitation itself is necessary, indeed it is the process of education. To delineate, he draws a distinction between emulation and imitation. The moments of genius are those in which we might identify shifts that both maintain and subvert the norms of a particular practice or genre. This is the reading that I want to put forth here. Um, they emulate their predecessors. These moments are miraculous and rare. The works of imitation, on the other hand, make up the process of education or of initiation. The distinction between emulation and imitation is one of kind and not merely of degree. The former conditions the possibility of the latter. Kant cites genius as that which, which establishes the methodical instruction to be taught in schools. He writes, while not themselves the result of imitation, the works of genius must yet serve others in that way, that is, as a standard or a rule for judging. Works of genius serve as examples for other good minds and give rise to a school, a methodical instruction in accordance with rules of its own. And while the exemplarity of genius sets up conditions for teaching, it cannot itself be taught. Kant writes, genius really consists in the happy relation which no science can teach and no diligence learn of finding ideas for a given concept on the one hand and on the other hitting upon the expression for these through which the subjective disposition of the mind is thereby produced as an accompaniment of a concept that can then be communicated to others. So it's the communication of a subjective disposition of the mind. The work of genius traverses the realm of determinate and communicable concepts. It communicates outside of the determinate realm of language, engaging in the transformation of what is outside of the bounds of communicability in its determinate form, but renders it communicable, offering a schema, as Kant says, for the supersensible. This is its radical originality. Calling from the supersensible, Genius offers a formulation of new concepts. As such, genius does more than offer variations on a theme. Its relation to its predecessors entails more than playing with the limitations of the form. It radically alters the form itself. Kant's account of genius hinges primarily around the problem of, um, of the accountability of this moment. When confronted with the question of genius and its access to the supersensible, he offers a kind of awkward account in some ways um, of that which exceeds accounting in a determinate form. Instead, the genius is always a moment, a middle term, between nature and culture, the imagination and understanding, the sensible and the supersensible. Genius can perform this middle function without itself being aware of how it does. The genius himself does not know the source of his own ideas, Kant reminds us. This is precisely why his genius cannot be taught. One cannot learn to write inspired poetry, however exhaustive all the rules for the art of poetry, and however excellent the models for it may be. No Homer or Wieland can indicate how his ideas, which are fantastic and yet at the same time rich in thought, arise and come together in his head, because he himself does not know it and thus cannot teach it to anyone else either. This unknowability of genius, its epistemologically unaccountable status, is supplemented by an account of its dependence on nature. Kant identifies genius as a middle term between nature and culture. For Kant, the talent of genius is derived from nature. It is, quote, the inborn predisposition of the mind 
the ingenium through which nature gives the rule to art. The kind of rulemaking, the activity of setting the limits of a practice, comes not arbitrarily from the subject. It comes for, from a particular relation between the imagination and the understanding that enables a kind of access to the truth of nature. The source of the rule is thus nature itself, and genius acts as a kind of conduit through which nature establishes itself in human activity. It is nature's exposition of itself under the guise of human action. This explanation renders possible the formation of new concepts as derivatives of the supersensible, an account that Kant must give in order to render the possibility of reflective judgment of indeterminate judgments in relation to the products of human creation. Genius, in short, is Kant's conceptual apparatus turned toward the capacity for the new, for the creation of concepts in human thought. Julia Kristeva's recent project, her trilogy on female genius, resuscitates this inquiry. For Kristeva, as for Kant, genius lies in the surpassing of oneself. In her three-part series on female genius, Kristeva exposes the exemplarity of an explicitly female genius in the figures of Hannah Arendt, Melanie Klein, and Colette. Kristeva defends her use of the hyperbolic and provocative designation of genius to each of these three women as one that elaborates the insertion of the feminine into the domain of the masculine. She sees the work of these women as representations of what a kind of feminine presence has done to radically restructure three aspects of human thought in the West in the 20th century. Each of these women were able to surpass themselves in their respective fields, critical philosophy in the case of Arendt, psychoanalysis in the case of Klein, and literature in the case of Colette. Their access to truth was not, on Kristeva's account, um, in the universal ideas as established by their disciplines, in their reality, this obscure category, but rather in their singularity. That is, the genius of these three women is found in their capacity to play with the boundaries and constraints of their respective fields by insisting on delimiting with respect to their singularity as individuals and primarily as women, their experience in the inadequacy of the forms of their practice. We might remind ourselves here of Kleist's uh, newspaper as a similarly positioned relation to constraint, um, but perhaps we can discuss that comparison further in the Q&A. I want to focus here on um, the first book in the trilogy, on Kristeva's treatment of Hannah Arendt. Arendt brings Kristeva back to her beginnings, to the insertion of politics, or I'm sorry, to the intersection of politics, poetry, and psychoanalysis. My own analysis will distill two of Kristeva's insight into Arendt's thought as an example of feminine genius. Um, first, her positing of census communis as a, necessi as a necessary element of political life, and coincidentally, um, as the political moment in Kant's thought. And second, her emphasis on natality. Um, by focusing on these two points, I want to suggest that we can find the consummate antipode of genius in a theory of judgment. That is, Kristeva's treatment of genius leads her to the elaboration of a theory of judgment um, as she turns to the work of Arendt. To this end, I will first elaborate what I mean when I say that Arendt brings Kristeva back to her beginnings. So here I want to lay out some conceptual tools as, Christe as uh, Kristeva develops them in revolution and poetic language. Um, and then once we have some of these key concepts, um, I want to return to this recent work on, um, on Arendt as an explicitly female genius who gives us an account of judgment. So we have kind of these, um, this notion of genius that um, is in some ways a revision of, of the kinds of uh, concepts of genius that I've been deriving from Kant. Um, and on the other hand, this treatment of judgment. And these are sort of two poles that I see um, like operating in Kristeva's work that um, give us ways to think about um, uh, the intersection of uh, poetics and politics. Okay, so in the prolegomenon to revolution in poetic language, Kristeva sets up a choreographical link between the work and movement of poetry and that of political revolution. The subject's transformation in poetry and her political transformation in revolution is not mere analogy for Kristeva. 
Her claim is not that the violence in political revolution simply resembles the transformation of the subject in poetry, some kind of microcosmic experiment and architectural scale model in which the subject's transformation is just applied to the body politic. Rather, the transformation of politics and the transformation of the subject are two phenomena that are both chronologically and materially linked. To take a Spinozist idea, uh, we might say that there are different attributes of the same substance. One is not fully what it is without the other's simultaneous fulfillment, a sort of reappropriated psychophysical parallelism in the subject's transformation encountering the text and the transformation of politics in the midst of a revolution. Chris Daver writes, the one brings about in the subject what the other introduces into society. The historical and political experience of the 20th century have demonstrated that one, that is the subject, cannot be transformed without the other, that is the political revolution, and vice versa. And I think that this is really um, key. The structures of subjectivity and transformation are co-constitutive of the structures of social transformation in the midst of revolution. As such, there is an unequivocal synchrony between aesthetic experience and political revolution. And yet, the real and material connection between these two remains obscure to me and to Kristeva herself. She asks, at what historical moment does social change um, tolerate or necessitate the manifestation of the signifying process in its poetic or esoteric form? Under what conditions does this esotericism in displacing the boundaries of socially established signifying practices correspond to socioeconomic change and ultimately even to revolution. So we can see that the change in the subject via the text is um, synchronically and materially linked. On the one hand, we see this claim, and yet at the same time, um, its, its connection to political revolution um, remains obscure. In order to grasp the saporia, let us retain the following key distinctions that run throughout Kristeva's work. So this is like um, a quick and kind of dirty account of uh, the distinction between the semiotic and the symbolic. I hate to do that, but it's just like key concepts that if you're not familiar with Kristeva, like, it won't make any sense. So here we go. The semiotic and the symbolic are two modalities of the signifying process. There are two trends that address the problem of externality in linguistic thought. Linguistic thought assumes that the sign is a substitute for, extra linguist, for the extra-linguistic, that there is an excess beyond the bounds of language. The semiotic addresses the so-called arbitrary relation between the signifier and the signified as one that is motivated through the notion of the unconscious, insofar as the theories of drives and primary processes, that is displacement and condensation, can connect these empty signifiers to psychosomatic functionings. What this does is replace the arbitrary relation between signifier and signified with an articulated one. It is articulated on the basis of the unconscious. As an articulate relation, this approach restores linguistic connection to an externality. But in spite of this articulated relation, um, for Kristeva, um, for want of a dialectical notion of the signifying process as a whole in which uh, signifiance puts the subject in process or on trial. There's this kind of dual understanding of this notion of a subject in process. We could talk about it if there are questions about it in the Q&A, but I'm gonna try to bracket it for the moment. Um, such considerations, no matter how astute, fail to take into account the syntactico-semantic functioning of language. This trend attempts to reintroduce formal linguistic relations into the pre oedipal and the excessive, and in so doing is unable to account for the subject formation on the basis of this process alone. Um, so rough sort of way of thinking about it would be that the semiotic um, is a way of articulating pre-linguistic, so like infantile bodily experience, um, um, and so it's bound up with these notions of the unconscious. The symbolic, on the other hand, addresses the problem of externality through the process of substitution. It places logical modal relations, relations of presupposition, and other relations between interlocutors within the speech act in a very deep, deep structure. Positing a subject of enunciation which introduces, through categorial intuition, both semantic fields of logical relations, which prove to be both intra- and translinguistic. The symbolic gives an account of the signifying process through determinant rules, in other words. 
The movement between these two modalities is what Kristeva calls negativity. She writes, the sole function of our use of the term negativity is to designate the process that exceeds the signifying subject, binding him to the laws of objective struggles in nature and in society. Negativity is the articulation for how the subject deals with what exceeds her, and it has its beginnings early on in the process of entering into the symbolic. Kristeva, again. If the symbolic function is a syntactic function, and if the latter consists essentially in linking a subject and a predicate, the formation of the symbol of negation precedes this function or coincides with its development. The distinction between the semiotic and the symbolic is thus understood on the basis of the movement of negation. The semiotic quora is no more than the place where the subject is both generated and negated. Another way of thinking through the role of negation as the delimiting function between the semiotic and the symbolic is to see the synthesis Kristeva performs between Hegel and Freud. Uh, bringing Freud's notion of rejection to bear on the role of the negative in Hegel's dialectical process, Kristeva sees herself as imbuing the logic of the dialectic with a certain materiality. Following Lenin, she explicitly says that this is um, yeah, following Lenin, uh, Kristeva calls negativity the, quote, fourth term of the true dialectic. It is the process that moves the dialectic through what is a false triplicity, the mediation, the supersession of pure abstractions of being and nothingness in the concrete where they are both only moments. Negativity is here a concept and therefore belongs to a contemplative theoretical system. It reformulates the static terms of pure abstraction as a process, dissolving and binding them within a mobile law. Thus, while still maintaining their dualism, negativity recasts not only the theses of being and nothingness, but all categories used in the contemplative system. Negativity characterizes the movement um, of the dialectic, the movement to the, to the um, it, it is the first negation, but then it also is the structure of the negation of the negation. So what um, this notion of negativity does for Kristeva is it allows her to articulate a logic of the dialectic um, that doesn't dwell in any one of the, the three um, movements. Turning to Freud's 1925 essay, Negation, Kristeva develops what she calls a material account of negativity, but asserts it through the development of the subject. Our conception of rejection will oscillate between two poles, she says, poles of drive and consciousness. And this ambiguity will reveal the ambiguity of process itself, which is both divided and unitary. In Freud's essay on negation, he posits it as the access of the unveiling of the unconscious. In the course of analysis, he explains it is the moments when the patient negates a statement or an idea that allows for the content of a repressed image or idea to make its way into consciousness. Negation is a way of taking cognizance of what is repressed, right? This is the moment where the, the patient says, no, in the dream, the figure was not my mother, and this, of course, reveals that it was. Um, uh, and it is in negation for Kristeva that the intellectual function is separated from the affective process. As Freud's investigation into negation continues, he wagers that negation is th at the origin of the intellectual function, it is the determination of what is taken into the subject and what is expelled, both in relation to the ideas and into the relation of objects. Kristeva pulls from this that all negative transformations, including lexical ones, already constitute a syntactic transformation in the course of language acquisition. Signified negation appears around the age of 15 months, so it coincides with the peak of the mirror stage and with holophrastic language acquisition. So as the basis of the subject formation, as the process of language acquisition negation operates as an inscription of aspects of the semiotic into the symbolic. We might think here of the semiotic as a designation of pre-linguistic bodily experience, I think I said this a moment ago, um, and of the symbolic as the process of signification um, that is a kind of acquisition um, from this experience into um, something that we might um, liken to determinate concepts, words. Um, given this conceptual apparatus, we might offer Kristeva's account of negativity a third historical anchor in addition to Hegel and Freud. This is in the figure of Kant's genius. That is, negativity, articulated as the process of movement between the semiotic and the symbolic, begins to develop as an analog to the activity of genius. Rendering a schema for the supersensible, 
Kant's account of genius might be read as the performance of what Kristeva will later call negativity, kind of par excellence. Genius enables the expansion of the mind, Kant says, in the quotation I used in the second epigraph to this paper. It's the expansion of the mind um, um, by setting the imagination free and presenting within the limits of given concepts and among the unbounded manifold of forms possibly agreeing with it, the one that connects its presentation with a fullness of thought to which no linguistic expression is fully adequate. Indeed, it seems to me that Kristeva's turn to the question of genius in her later work exposes a continuity of thought that runs along this Kantian aporia. The mysterious source of genius in Kristeva's revision of the problem is no longer enigmatic nature as it was in Kant, but is the unconscious in its semiotic motility. That's like the thesis. In case you were wondering. <laughs> okay, so, okay, this is the last section and it's like a page, so. Oh, good. Okay, so uh, from genius to judgment. With Kristeva's concepts of the semiotic, the symbolic and negation now loosely in tow. I want to examine Kristeva's recent turn to a rent. There is an expansion of the mind beyond the bounds of language as I formulated it through both Kristeva and Kant. And this is the special talent of genius, but it is also implied in the formulation of a census communis. What a rent defined as the specifically human sense because communication that is speech depends upon it. Kristeva observes, the judgment that Arendt proposes to be the foundation of politics is not a cognitive, and we might here add determinative, judgment. For as an approval of taste through common sense, judgment defies understanding. This account of common sense is a turn in the right direction on Kristeva's account, but stops short of a sufficient analysis. In the end, because the particulars, um, the, the particular is without, without a doubt the only mirror that is held up to the human species. It is difficult to imagine what this general or this common sense would look like. Kristeva is here identifying the aporia that served as the impetus into our articulation of the subject 30 years ago and into her, to, in her um, desire to articulate the link between the esoteric and the political. She places her finger in doing this, I think, on one of the key problems with Arendt's account of politics as dependent upon the census communis, that it lacks a theory of affects or a theory of drives and primary processes that would uh, be needed in order to account for uh, the formation of something like a census communis. I think it is through an engagement with Kristeva's early work that we might begin to develop such an, an account. So this is sort of the, the gesture at the end of the, the paper. Um, that, that there is something in the linking of, um, of Kristeva's m recent work on Arendt that, that gives us um, a kind of fulfillment of Arendt's project, but one that she probably herself wouldn't be so keen on. Um, that, that there's a, a kind of necessary uh, theory of, of something like the unconscious that um, that would help to give a robust sense of what this census communis is. Kristeva's less contentious engagement with Arendt, where the work of the two women is much more in harmony than in dissonance, is in the question of natality, the possibility of the new and the necessity of birth. So here again we have the kind of antipode, we're moving back and forth between the theme of judgment and that of genius. Um, where genius is bound up with the question of natality. Kristeva writes, a full experience of natality would inevitably include birth, life, an affirmation of the uniqueness of each birth, and a continual rebirth of the life of the mind. It is this rebirth in the life of the mind that has guided the speculations I've offered here, and that have brought together likes of Kleist, Kant, Kristeva, and Arendt. I've suggested that the rebirth in the life of the mind entails the poetic mutation of forms. Clay's newspaper is one example of this practice and offers a helpful illustration of what it is uh, to work within and against the constraint of a form. Working against the constraints of a form, Chris Davis female geniuses reflect her own practice. Um, just as Arendt, we might say, pushed against the kind of Heideggerian insistence on death as the limiting form of ontology, in her formulation of natality, 
Chris Davis' emphasis on the semiotic as an articulation of pre-linguistic infantile bodily experience is her own gesture of female genius, her own delimiting and restructuring of the necessary constraints of psychoanalytic theory.